there are things to look at together today in the Bible. I want to look at the inspiration of Scripture, particularly at the phrase that men were carried along by the Holy Spirit. A thing that is said in Second Peter in chapter 1. And uh, the reason for that is that the way that God wrote his word was, you know, very intentional. That God caused it to be written. God controls it. And um, it contains what he intends. And, and uh, what he intends is its content. So it's worth looking at this and understanding how they did it, how they, you know, came to these things. Or maybe it's worth understanding how they didn't do it and how they didn't come to these things, as there have been many uh, theories put forth for how the Bible was written to begin with. So the first thing is Second Peter 1, um, and it's verse 21 that we're going to. But the, the, the first thing is that prophets were sometimes prophets without even knowing that they were. They prophesied not realizing that what they were saying was going to become that word of God, uh, the thing that would be written that was inspired. And uh, so, you know, second letter from Peter in the uh, start of that letter in chapter one, but at the end of the chapter there, 21, he said that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And it is a literal carried along there. He's talking about like as if the Holy Spirit picked them up and took them to where they were going. Now, you may recall, if you're familiar with Old Testament prophets, that that is uh, fairly literally how they describe it. Ezekiel speaks of being carried up or taken up in the spirit to some place that was far away. Um, and there are others who talk that way. And I think that the point of that is that God causes it to be done. The prophecy comes not because people want it to come, because they want to be prophets or they want to write, but because the Spirit caused it to be written. And I thought at first when I read that, it was kind of odd, like as if God forces it. Um, but actually, it's true. That's exactly what he's saying. <laughs> he does. So have a look at it. Uh, we go over to Romans 3 and establish this thing that is said there in your New Testament. Paul said in verse 2, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. The oracles are the utterances, the things that God says. Who knows what God says? Well, it is the Jews. The ancient Israel was entrusted with what did God say? It was up to them to write Scripture, it was up to them to decide what books were Scripture, all that kind of thing. You may have heard of some discussions uh, among men about uh, the canon of Scripture. You know, what books should be included and what books are not. And, and I know like the Church of England and the Catholic Church include some extra books that you don't find in your Bibles today. Um, you know... I don't think it's worth getting into arguments about those things. I think what you do is Romans 3, verse 2, which is ancient Israel was entrusted with the oracles of God. Because the reason why your Bible contains the books it does and not those Catholic ones is that the Jews never recognized those Catholic ones. <laughs> That's why. It was the Old Testament that the Jews of the first century recognized as the Old Testament. Well, that's why we have it, and Romans 3, 2 tells you exactly why that is valid and binding. You're supposed to have what they said was the Word of God. Second thing is to continue here in Romans 3 and understand, what about the Jews themselves? What if some were not faithful? Well, certainly some of them were not. Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Well, it, it doesn't. You know, but people think that that's true. Like, well, some of them were bad actors. Some of them were bad characters. They might have had uh, evil motives or what they thought that they were trying to do was not right. That might be true. But their faithlessness does not nullify the faithfulness of God. 
which is what Romans 3, 4 tells you by no means does something wrong with their own personal lives or moral character that has no, no bearing on the word of God that was written down. Let, let God be true, though every one of them were a liar. Um, and people think, well, this means God is truer than man. If, if all of the earth were liars, that, that's not what it means. Although that's true, that's not what it means. It's saying, even if every Israelite who ever penned a book of scripture was an absolute liar and fraud, it wouldn't change the truthfulness of God's word as it was recorded. That's what he means. Let God be true, though every one of them were a liar, as it is written that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. It's God's words that are getting out through these servants, however imperfect they might be. So even if they were liars, even if they were trying to fight God, the thing that got written was what God wanted written. And his words are what is justified. And when people judge, if you will, or try to put God on trial, they're only able to try his word as it's recorded. And that is not going to be successful. He'll prevail because the word is right. The word is good. It's what he intends, regardless of the character of the person who wrote it down. They're just earthen vessels. And so are we. We're just earthen vessels. You know, sometimes people talk about, um, and you may or may not know, that the New Testament uh, is was originally captured on papyri. And, uh, you know, there's so many thousands of them, which compares kind of radically <laughs> uh, versus any other book from antiquity. Uh, if you've heard of Plato's Republic, there are about eight copies, I believe, um, for example. And for the New Testament, there are thousands. Um, and like, they're not even close. There, there isn't anything that's even close in terms of how many copies there are. But sometimes people will point to these and they'll point to you know, spelling variations, word order variations, uh, synonyms, you know, a uh, skipped line here or there by accident, and try to say, well, this is proof that God's word is not trustworthy. But no, it, it really is not. They're earthen vessels like anything else. There's going to be some imperfections there, and it's all right, because you have all the other ones, and it's obvious what this means. And even the ones that seem to be missing something or seem to have a change uh, phrase or, or something, they really, none of them amount to any difference. They, they, there's nothing missing that is, uh, you know, a, a serious problem. Um, there's nothing there that's like, oh, this is the only occurrence of it, and it's missing in this text. Like, no, that doesn't happen at any point ever. <laughs> uh, there's always another copy that has it. So, yeah, that's just earthen vessels. My, you know, my way of looking at that is, can you imagine if we had a copy that was an original and contained the ink that the Apostle Paul wrote with, <laughs> or maybe his fingerprints or DNA, you know, imagine the world wars that would be started over that thing. So, no. That's not the way that God works, never has been. Uh, come with me to John 11 and consider this example because it's kind of crazy, but it's true. We're proving that God gets his way even if the chosen vessel through whom it is gotten is actively fighting him. <laughs> John eleven forty seven 47, beginning. Chief priests and Pharisees gathered about the council or gathered the council saying, what will we do? This man performs many signs. This man, Jesus, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand John eleven fifty. It's better for you that one man should die for the people. Not the whole nation should perish. 
Now you think about this, Caiaphas, the high priest, he is the one who oversaw the execution of Jesus, the crucifixion. He's the one who led that charge to have Jesus put to death. What John tells you about it is verse 51. He didn't say this of his own accord. But since he was high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. This man did not, you know, he wasn't saying this, if you will. I mean, he thought he was saying this of his own accord, right? He thought that he was working out the plan for how they're going to kill Jesus. That's what he thought when he said, it's better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. When he said that, he's thinking, well, we need to kill Jesus instead of letting this become a problem for us with Rome. And so in his mind, he's architecting the death of the Lord. But in point of fact, he is the high priest. And by reason of his office, he prophesied. And what he said, though he thought it was of his own accord, was not of his own accord. This was what God caused him to say. Now, the catch there is when you think about it, uh, do we have anything else that Caiaphas said? Right? There's precious little. The only thing... Uh, you know, some some teaching, some assertion about the nation and its deliverance that he had to say that was captured in any way is John 11, verse 50. The one prophecy that he was given by the Spirit is the thing that got recorded. He got into the New Testament. Here he is thinking he's going to murder Jesus. He's going to find a way to get out. But actually, he's a verse in the Bible. <laughs> A legitimate, correct verse, John eleven fifty. It is better for us that one man dies for the people rather than the whole nation perish. We do need the death of Jesus to save us. That's true. So it's kind of incredible to think about this one who thought he was attacking the Lord, who never would have consented to having his words recorded in Scripture in the New Testament, the, the Christian Bible, as people call it, um, is nonetheless given the one bit of prophecy that he has that ever has been ascribed to his name, and it's in John eleven fifty. That's telling us what God said in Romans three: Let God be true, though every one of them were a liar. And what Peter said: Prophecy didn't come by the will of man. Men spoke from God as they were carried. By the Holy Spirit. He didn't say this of his own accord, says John eleven fifty one. 51. But since he was the high priest, he prophesied. As telling us very plainly, even those who thought they were opposed to God, those who thought they were going to prevent or thwart his purposes. If the time was right and the office was right, the thing they said got recorded and that became scripture. What God caused to be written is what he intended to be written. Which is how he can say the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And even if some were unfaithful, that doesn't nullify God's faithfulness. Let God be true, though every one of them proved to be a liar. And for that matter, when he quotes the Psalms saying that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you're judged. He's quoting David in uh, Psalm 52, um, speaking after he had gone into Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan came and condemned him. And he said, God is right. And I was wrong. So even he accepted that he did wrong, though he had an office and he had authority and he knew better. And so when God speaks, God is right. It's just 
a very clear case that they are making. Um, think about it this way. Jeremiah 30 is where we're going next. The fact is that the prophets of old were told to write. <laughs> write this. And a vision was presented to them. Something for, that they would see. You know, that's it's clearly not reality. It's like a dream, if you will. Something that's not real, but something they can see and understand and they can write it down. And it's presented before them in such a way that they write it down in such a way. That's the word of God. Jeremiah 30, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, write in a book all the words that I've spoken to you. For behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will restore the fortunes of my people, Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I'll bring them back to the land I gave their fathers. They'll take possession of it. So in all these things, they do speak of restoration. They do speak of uh, reclamation of the, the people having salvation, deliverance. The days are coming, he said. But did you notice there in verse 2 of Jeremiah 30? Write in a book the words that I've spoken to you. You know, they were given what to write. They were told what to put down. And he has them writing it. He has Jeremiah writing it in a book. It's going to be there for people to refer to it again and come back to it. Which is actually very similar to the rest of what Peter said in 2 Peter 1. He said, I'm leaving this world, but I'm going to make sure that you can call these things to mind. And the way he did that, of course, was by writing 1 Peter and 2 Peter. The prophet Habakkuk, um, which I think is pronounced Chewbacca, um, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 2, the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that he may run who reads it. So the vision or the dream is given to them or the words of God directly. They write it down. They write it in a way that is plain on tablets, meaning this is intended, just like the book, to be something that anybody who knows how to read can come and read. They can take off of the page exactly what he put down on the page, which is exactly what God told him to do. And the intent that God has for Habakkuk is so that the person who reads it may run. That is, the person who reads what God causes to be written gets the message. <laughs> They're picking up what he's laying down. It, you know, that warns them to run. It warns them about what's coming in this particular case, and there are others about salvation that is coming, etc. But you get it. He causes it to be written, and what he causes to be written, it brings the desired effect. It causes or triggers the desired actions in those who read it or hear it. And again, he said the vision awaits an appointed time. Seems slow, but it will come. That's true. The prophecies of God were built up, gathered by the people of Israel over millennia. Isaiah chapter 30 <clears throat> at verse 8 is told, Go write it before them on a tablet, inscribe it in a book, so that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. Same thing. They're being told to write, put it on a tablet, put it in a book. It is for a time that is coming, and people will be able to refer back to it. It's a witness forever. Why do this? Because they are rebellious people. Isaiah 30 verse 9 continues. Lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord. That's an interesting thing when you think about it. What's Isaiah writing down? It's the instruction of the Lord. And when you read the words of Isaiah, what are you doing? You're hearing. <laughs> You're hearing the word of the Lord. They say to the seers, do not see. They say to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. 
That's what the people said. And the antidote from God was, remember? Oops, wrong one. It was, write it before them on a tablet. Inscribe it in a book. Make it a witness forever. That's the answer to the problem that they will they are not willing to hear. That they tell the prophets do not see. Or I'm saying the, the seers do not see. The prophets do not prophesy. Give us smooth things. Don't talk to us about the Holy One of Israel anymore. That rejection is exactly why he caused it to be written down. Therefore, thus says the Holy One, because you despise this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and rely on them, therefore this iniquity will be to you like a breach in a high wall, bulging, about to collapse, whose breaking comes suddenly, in an instant. So the people, that generation, well, they pass. You know, time's up. But the word of God endures forever. Though they're gone and Isaiah's gone, we still have his word, and we're going to for forevermore. It will be with us. The other interesting thing from Peter, this time First Peter, is that the former prophets were told, at the time that they were writing, they were told that what they were writing was to be for later. Uh, we just looked at Isaiah and Jeremiah and Habakkuk too. They all talked about the time is coming, a future time, a perpetual witness. But look at some of these things. In First Peter 1, we're told, verse 10, Concerning the salvation that is our salvation in Christ, the prophets who prophesied about the grace to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or what time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of the Christ and his subsequent glories. We're saying here they, they searched and inquired carefully. I mean, the prophets knew they were talking about something big. You can imagine being Isaiah, writing Isaiah 53, because God told you to write that, and you're asking God exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch asked God in Acts 8, about whom is this? What is this? Well, there is suffering, and there's glory to follow, too. Is this somebody? Is this some nation is this a, a time what is this right they wanted to know they were godly men in some cases it was revealed to them first peter 1 12 they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been renounced to you announced to, to you through those who preach the good news to you by the holy spirit sent from heaven things into which angels long to look the angels in heaven didn't even know what God was about to do in Christ Jesus and the establishment of the church. They didn't understand what was happening. The prophets were told they were serving not themselves, but you. They were told it was, it's not for you. It's for a future time, a future generation. And yet you, that is we, the recipients of the New Testament, are in the position of now the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you. That's our position. The apostles have now said what before had not been known. And Peter, I'm sorry, Paul says the same thing in Ephesians 3. In the fourth verse, he tells them, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. But when you read this book, you perceive the insight of the apostle Paul. It's what the Lord told Habakkuk, write it plainly so that the one who reads it may run. They're supposed to get it. They're supposed to understand it. And this um, mystery, this knowledge, about God, you know, saving the entire world, not just Israel, was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the apostles and prophets, by the Spirit, to the apostles and prophets, by the Spirit. So, that time 
That is to say, the old prophets, they didn't know. That's very much what Peter said. But now we know. It's, this is done. There's not a mystery anymore. The mystery is revealed. If you understand the apostles' insight into the mystery, well, then there's no longer a mystery <laughs> by definition. So if you go back to the old prophets, for example, Daniel, in Daniel 12, it's the last chapter of Daniel. And he records it like this. In the eighth verse, I heard, but I did not understand. And I said, my Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? And he told me, go your way, Daniel. The words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. You just keep on keeping on, Danny. <laughs> oh, Danny boy. <laughs> Many will purify themselves, make themselves white and be refined. The wicked shall act wickedly. It's what the revelation says, right? Let him who is righteous be righteous. Let him who is wicked be wicked. It's not saying just remain where you're at. It's a, it's a quotation of Daniel 12. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. And he explains some things with the 13th verse is, go your way till the end. You will rest and stand in your allotted place at the end of the days. This is what, what Peter is talking about. That he wanted to know, what does this mean? What's the outcome? And he was told, it's about the end. You go your way. You will have rest. You'll stand in your allotted place at that time. Just that's all they got was it's not for you. It's for somebody else. It's coming. Um, in the eighth chapter of Daniel, you get the message, if you hadn't already, that the content of that message is controlled by God himself. He's the one who causes what is written to be written. and also causes what is omitted to be omitted. Uh, in Daniel 8, verse 26, the vision of the evenings and mornings has been told and is true, but seal up the vision. It refers to many days from now. So he writes it, sets it down, understands that we just don't know what it is. It's coming. Seal it up. Uh, how does it make sense when you say seal? Well. If you're uh, if you're writing in a scroll, you know at that time a scroll is kind of like it's kind of like our roll of um, of uh, paper towels, where you know you you're like unrolling it to pull it open, except it actually has words on it, right? So if it's sealed, it's like when you first pull it out of the bag and you know it's stuck together so it doesn't come unraveled. <laughs> That's the seal. So you've written down the scroll and you've sealed it. Meaning it, you know, it's not for spilling um, open. It's for preservation or transport or whatever. With regard to the content control, we see that this happened to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. Who finished, you know, who just told us in Ephesians 3 that we could understand his insight into the mystery by reading what he wrote. and yet. He also tells us in 2 Corinthians 12 that there were some things he heard that he's not allowed to repeat. Where he says, I must go on boasting, 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 1, though there's nothing to be gained by it, I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Well, because he's had some. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. Well, we need to talk about this. Peter warned us in 2 Peter 3 that there are some things hard to understand. And this is one of them. He's talking about himself. Okay, first thing we should say is this is demure. He is, <laughs> this is a certain amount of, you know, fake humility, protest, distancing himself. He's talking about himself. All right, we'll get there. But one of the first clues is 14 years ago. That's the number from Galatians chapter 1 and 2. It was 14 years 
between the time that he obeyed the gospel and the time that he went back to Jerusalem. Right, so this is the time at which he starts to write these letters. It's him. He's the guy. And this happened to him when Jesus appeared to him somewhere at the beginning in Acts 9, right? The third heaven. Yeah, we need to explain this. Heaven is such a bad translation. It's sky. It's a sky, actually. Which is why, you know, and the Greek word is Uranus or Uranus. So, you know, the planet Uranus is actually the planet heaven or sky. Um, perhaps because at the time they thought it was the farthest out one they were going to be able to see. I'm not sure, but whatever. Um, what does it mean to be the third heaven or the third sky? Well, we know there's a sky that we live in, that we inhabit, where the birds fly and the clouds and the rain and all that. That's one sky. The second sky would be whatever's beyond those with the, um, you know, the celestial, if you want to go uh, Latin, um, the heavenly bodies, uh, stars and planets and whatever, what we might call outer space. That's the second sky. What's that third sky? What is that heaven? That's the spiritual. Whatever's beyond what we perceive in, in physical reality, that third sky is heaven. What we would call heaven. A spiritual place, something beyond the universe, you know, beyond physical reality. So he's saying he was caught up to heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. And I know this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know, God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Yeah, there were some things being said that he's not allowed to say. Um, and that could be a problem, right? But it's not because in the seventh verse, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. <laughs> quite funny actually <laughs> that he would do this <laughs> uh you know what the thorn in the flesh is it's the church at corinth by the way just keep reading the chapter go into 13 1 and 2 you'll see it's corinth the, the greatness of the revelations is you know the effect of that is dampened uh by seeing the outcome of the teaching that he's doing, the reception that it has. <laughs> but whatever that might be, the point of our lesson is that Paul definitely did receive direct revelations. I guess I better turn my phone off. Sorry. Um, he received revelations. There were things said, things that he's privy to that you and I were not privy to, things that are not lawful for man to utter. And, you know, that could make you conceited. And he was given a way to, to be reminded. <laughs> and uh, knowledge only does so much good, right? Knowledge, and, and he would write about knowledge and love, and that love builds up, love edifies, um, and rightly so. In the Revelation, we capture this as well. You notice in the first verses, the opening of this entire letter. It's one through three of Revelation one. The revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things that must soon take place. He made it known or showed it by sending his messenger to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to everything that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed are those who hear it and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. 
And in this way, it's very different from what was said to them before. Here, God is still using symbols and still signifying by means of this messenger. In this case, it's John. But the thing that's being written is the words. And when those words are read aloud or when those words are heard, that's the power of God. When you keep what is written in it, like you said in Habakkuk, let, you know, so that he who reads it may run. <laughs> when you keep what's written in it, you are blessed. And the time is near. Not seal it up. It's for a future time. Generations to come. That's not what it says. It says the time is near. Which is also what he said in verse 1. Things which must soon take place. Everything in that book happened very soon, quickly, in the lifetime of those to whom it was written. Otherwise, why write it to them? It makes no sense. But God made it known. It was symbols. It was words. The words are to be read and to be heard and understood and kept. And the time is near. It's now. Later in the same chapter, the ninth verse, John said, I am your brother. I am your partner in the tribulation and the kingdom, the patient endurance in Jesus. I was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Remember what Peter said? They only spoke when they were carried by the Holy Spirit. And he said, I was in the spirit. And I heard behind me a loud voice, like a trumpet, saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. It's very much like the prophets that we read. Write this down, put it in a book, send it out. Not that he gets a chance to go visit those churches. He cannot leave the Isle of Patmos. It's an, it's an exile. It's a, it's a, well, it's a death trap. It's a starvation sentence. He won't be leaving the island, but he will write this down, and the message will get to the islands, it will, or will get to the churches. In the 10th chapter of the Revelation is another example, and then we'll close that down. But in this example, John sees a mighty messenger, a mighty angel come down from heaven, wrapped in a cloud with a rainbow over his head, his face like the sun, his legs like pillars of fire. And he had a little scroll open in his hand and set his right foot on the sea and left foot on the land. And he called out with a loud voice like a lion roaring. And when he called out, the seven thunders sounded. And when the seven thunders had sounded, I was about to write. But I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders have said and do not write it down. Which is interesting. Do you see John is a, was a personal friend of Jesus, but here he is dying. And God said, here are things for them to know, things that they need to know. It's not everything that was seen. Because there's some things here that were said by the seven thunders. And God said, do not write that down. And he didn't. It's like Paul hearing things in the third sky that are not he's not allowed to repeat. And he didn't repeat them. It's telling us that God's in control. I mean, that's the bottom line of this. God is in control. The book contains what he intends for it to contain. It says what he means for it to say, so that what is written down when you read that thing becomes the instruction for your life. Regardless of the character of the people who wrote it down, or the people who preserved it, or the people who tra uh, transmitted it from generation to generation, but there's no telling where that is. That could be all over the map. Romans 3, but let God be true, though every one of them were a liar, that you may be justified in your words. It's what the, it's what the psalm says, and that's true.
God's word is true, though everybody were a liar, though everybody were to fight him and to uh, oppose him, his purpose would still be accomplished. His word would still get out there and it would still say what he wants it to say. And that would still be the truth that you and I need to know. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. Because he's God. He's powerful. He can do that. And he has done that. Demonstrably, he has done that. You saw some of the worst characters whose words became scripture. He's getting it done. He's accomplishing it in the way that only God can. So today, if you believe in God, you recognize your soul's lost estate. Well, repent. Confess Jesus as the Son of God. Be buried in baptism for forgiveness of sins. Putting to death the old person, the old way of life, starting a new chapter in Christ Jesus by being baptized in his name for forgiveness of sins. We will help you. We'll help you to do that. Have water prepared, whatever else is necessary to help you to obey the gospel of the Lord. Today, if you are already a child of God but have not lived right, repent. Pray God for forgiveness. Let us pray for you too. We'll encourage one another. We all need help to get to the next stage of life in eternity with God. But He has given us a word. A word that we can all take to heart, that we can all understand, that provides everything that we need when we need it. If today we can help you to obey the gospel or help you with our prayers, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing the song selected.